All right, hello and welcome to this video, the first one about the Levant, and we're gonna be talking about Canaan and Phoenicia. Now, here again is the goal of the overview, but I wanna highlight something else on this page too. Uh, this is a Canaanite religious icon, and it has some both Mesopotamian and Egyptian influences. That's really important, because this region is all about how those two influences play together and how they result in unique outcomes that are different than both of those other places. Uh, this is actually bronze with gold, thick gold foil on it from the Met Museum. Now. Here, you can probably begin to guess what's uh, going to be the story here, because you can see Mesopotamia over here on the right. You can see Egypt's little delta down there on the left. Canaan is this small strip of land between major empires. It is composed of a diverse range of people who had shared cultural features and who were influenced by both of those other places. Now, this is the story over time. You can see ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia over here, the big Mesopotamia with all these different kingdoms, and Egypt in its new kingdom, big expansionary phase. And it has conquered this entire region. And then over here, just about uh, 700 years later, you have the Assyrian Empire that reaches out and gobbles up even the kingdom of Egypt and takes basically all of Canaan over here. So this area had its own unique culture, but it was very frequently between these two major zones that spawned big, powerful empires. And I'm going to give you a, a timeline overview of them. You can see some Egyptian depictions of these folks over here uh, so that you have a sense of where we're going and what we're going to talk about. Now, it starts with Jericho, right? Like, that's one of these early, 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 early settlements back from the early Neolithic period, some of the earliest that we have. That's in this area. So it's got this big, long history. And... For about 2000 to 1200 BCE, that's the mid-late Bronze Age time frame, uh, you have these major urban centers, big cities like Hatzor and Megiddo and Kadesh that are in this area and show this unique culture. We can see through the artifacts that we find there that they're not Egyptian and they're not Mesopotamian either. They're, they're unique. And in fact, in about 1650, Egyptians get invaded by a group probably of these Canaanites who the Egyptians then called the Hyksos, and they briefly have control over Egypt. I mean, comparatively briefly. Uh, but then later in this time period, Egypt and the Hittites, another empire that's, that's really from the sort of modern, what is modern-day Turkey area, fight over the region. And they go back and forth with their big old empire fists. But then this thing happens called the Bronze Age, Bronze Age Collapse, which we'll talk more about in uh, a moment. But it's like a big reset button. And after that, big changes happen. And we have the emergence of the two civilizations that we're going to study in this particular unit. We're going to look at the Phoenicians and also the Israelites in a later video. So during this time frame, the Canaanite territory, folks who would call themselves that, shrinks to just coastal settlements. Uh, oh, okay. Talk about Phoenicians here. There's a whole shift in the economy and culture where they shift to being this like trading maritime coastal folk. It's really interesting. And they encounter other seafaring people like the Greeks who are the ones who give them the name Phoenicians uh, because they would have called themselves, again, something different. And then from about 1000 BCE to 702 BCE, Tyre, one of the major cities um, that existed after the collapse, spreads its colonies along with some of the other cities across the Mediterranean Sea basin, like in North Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, which is like Spain, that area, and then Sicily and Sardinia. But in 701 BCE, that's when the Assyrian Empire actually conquers Tyre. And the center of Phoenician society shifts to Carthage, who we will meet again in a later unit when they fight with Rome. But let's get back to this Bronze Age collapse thing, right? This big reset button. Uh, there is this moment where all these ancient, highly organized civilizations might have gotten totally beaten up by a couple weird weirdos on boats. But uh, let's take a look at the theory here. This is one of the theories about why there's a sudden lack of historical sources and why all these places get burned to the ground and also why all these, uh, these empires collapse at the same time. Well, here's the thought. All these different people who are f maybe fleeing something or invading something, uh, they move across in generally this, era, this way going uh, east here. And... All these empires, the Hittite Empire, the Egyptian New Kingdom, the Assyrian Empire, the early one over there, uh, they get all their stuff burned down. Uh, the Egyptians just barely resist this and just barely hold themselves together, but they lose control of this region that is in here, which is set in flames. Uh, 
And so there's this moment where all these invaders seem to come and sort of ruin everything that had existed up until that point. But maybe that's not the whole story, right? Because we can see some actual ecological changes that may well have caused this. So this is from uh, 2000 BCE, during the Bronze Age, all the way up to today, actually. But you can see over here in the Bronze Age, look how long it lasts till about right there. And look what happens. The Mycenaean civilization collapses, the Hittite Empire falls, um, but there are droughts during this time frame. The Yellow River freezes, frost in July in China, and the Shang Dynasty collapses within the same really like narrow time period. Look at that. Uh, it's fascinating. So the theory is famine resulting from drought or other natural disasters drive these people to try to find a new place to not starve to death. And they find these empires full of granaries with grain prepared for just such an occasion. And it gets real bad. Regardless, after that, these people who would later become known as the Phoenicians find their home along the coastline in the Mediterranean Sea. And they set up some of the cities that you can see here. Uh, the rivers and the mountains that are in this area cut the land into little tiny inhabitable chunks. And that means that not very much land is good for agriculture, and it forces you to kind of be on your own. So they developed into small city-states rather than into big empires. Uh, but they did have access to timber, which is a very desirable resource for places like Mesopotamia and Egypt that just do not have that many trees. Um, and they also had lots of these other resources you can see on the map. And so because they were between these big empires, they could be traders. And they, in fact, made their living doing this. And then located in an offshore island, Tyre, which is the, right here, was practically unconquerable. Because basically they said, like, listen, we do not want to have to deal with all of you inland people with whatever's going on with you. I'm going to just be here near the sea. Leave me alone. And so they did. They did lots of sea stuff. Look at these trade routes. Look at all that. That big red line. All of those are routes that we know that the Phoenicians traded along. The Greeks were up here, and they definitely traded with the Greeks. Uh, and you can see these different places where they set up colonies as well. Memphis is not a colony. That's just another major city. But um, these areas along the Mediterranean, uh, they had folks now who spoke their same language out in those places so they could trade there more easily. So they would have called themselves the you know, Canaanites, uh, but we call them Phoenicians because the Greeks called them that, and that's just how it has stuck. But you can see an example of one of their ships here that they would have traded on. This is a modern recreation, of course. Same thing down here. This is an artistic recreation of what Phoenician Tyre with its big walls out on its own island might have looked like. They were these seaside cities, and they had diverse populations compared to the other empires around them who were a little bit more homogenous with very similar kinds of people inside of them, uh, at least within their core areas. Then they were led by a very different kind of person. Uh, you remember in Shang Dynasty China, there were these warrior aristocrats. Well, in the Phoenician cities, they were merchant aristocrats, people who had lots of money and could have powerful political roles. But this was interesting because rather than needing to be a super good fighter and leader of battles or a, I don't know, god king who inherited the throne, you could move up socially and politically just by becoming wealthy. Um, women in this society had more power than in societies that were nearby, which is really interesting. Uh, religion, though, was strongly Mesopotamian with some unique elements and even some Egyptian inclusions in time frames when the Egyptians had sway in the region. And that religion spread to the colonies. And in fact, it survives longer in the colonies. Uh, and now slavery was also a feature of their society. And it existed primarily for war captives or locals uh, who were enslaved at Carth uh, colonies like Carthage. So not so much is known about the political life of Tyre and other Phoenician cities because we lack some sources, which we'll talk about later. We have some king's names that have been written down in more durable materials than what they wrote their everyday stuff on, but it seems like politics was most likely dominated by wealthy merchant families. And they weren't really like an empire, like I mentioned before, just a loose organization of city-states, all separated by rivers and mountains from one another. 
And the problem with that is that they were under constant threat of invasion by outsiders. The Hittites and the Egyptians before the Bronze Age collapse, and then afterwards by Assyria, and then Babylonia, and then Persia, just sweeping in from Mesopotamia and variously threatening them, taking money from them, or trading with them, but then also later conquering them. And their access to trade resources made them really important to either make friends with or control. And you can see some evidence of that over here. We have some bronze fragments from an Assyrian palace gate, and it shows them collecting tribute, which is basically like, you know, bribe money to not destroy us, please, uh, from the Phoenician cities. Economically, clearly this is very important. You can see these ancient trade routes and where they took place. And notice Phoenicia is right at this important meeting place between all these different trade routes. And you can see an example of their ship down here with little cutaways. Like, pause the video and take a look at that, because it's a cool little page. Now, they traded in raw materials like cedar, which is a kind of tree wood, uh, and then also metals, incense, which is a really nice smelling thing to burn. Um, and it was used often for religious rituals. Papyrus, the Egyptian paper, wine, spices, salted fish, crafted luxury goods like textiles. So, you know, things that you've woven together, uh, carved ivory and glass. And... They made these colonies primarily as an outlet for excess population, but really it was about getting new sources of goods, uh, new interesting things to sell, and also new trading partners. And they are perhaps best known for a kind of purple, this red purple known as Tyrian purple because you mostly got it from the city of Tyre. Um, it was not just bright and beautiful, it was also permanent. And it's not that easy to make permanent dyes. So uh, they made it from the shells of these snails that could only be found in this and some other limited places. And so they became known for that. Finally, the last reason that we really know the Phoenicians is because of the writing system they invented. It, in fact, is perhaps the most lasting feature. And they came up with this thing called alphabetic writing, where each symbol represents a sound. They left the vowels implied, but later alphabetic systems would add those. Um, and this significantly simplified reading and writing, because instead of having to memorize hundreds of different symbols, you only had to memorize maybe like a dozen, a couple dozen, I guess, at this point. But it made literacy so much more attainable. It was possible for way more people, and it took way less time to do. It was adopted by lots of different groups of people and uh, others up through today. You can even see some of the similar features of these letters to the ones we use. Like, look at that M. Look at that N. Look at that H, right? It's fascinating. Um, the problem is that we have relatively limited written records from the Phoenicians because they wrote their stuff on papyrus and it's kind of fragile and they were conquered by outside people who are not known to be the most respectful of other people's writing utensils and materials. And then they spread their colonies out around the Mediterranean Sea, which means that all of their stuff got spread out over those places. So we can see their, their traditions and their legacy as much through their culture and writing as it spread as where we would find it in the actual place where they originated. And Carthage in particular will play a big role when we get to talking about Rome. So that is the end of our video about the Phoenicians. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>